Welcome back to the show, everybody. Uh, as you can tell, uh, I picked up uh, bronchitis while I was at the party, but you know what? It was all worth it. We're all going to get better, and it's going to get better for all of us in the crypto space. I've got an interview lined up with Brooks Entwistle with uh, At The Edge on Payments and Payments TV, and I'm going to let that spin for you guys so you can hear all the great information from Brooks Entwistle from Ripple. Let's roll that beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. All right. Welcome back, everybody. I'm going to let this thing play, try to save my voice a little bit. Enjoy this video. It's really great and got a lot of great information in it from Brooks Whistle from Ripple. Enjoy. I'm Austin Prey, senior reporter here at Payments. Joining me today is Brooks Entwistle, uh, the senior vice president of global customer success and managing director of APAC and MENA at Ripple. Thanks for joining us today, Brooks. Great to be with you all. Thanks, Austin. And today we're talking about, you know, an exciting topic, uh, crypto trends in business, specifically around payments. Um, and so, you know, diving right into that crypto blockchain technology, uh, they've both been honing their real world utility for over a decade now. Um, what do you see as some of the future crypto trends in business, specifically as, you know, as it relates to the payment occasion? Yeah, we're excited for this, you know, future, but we're also kind of doing the same thing we've done for a decade here at Ripple. We set out to solve what we thought was one of the great intractable problems in finance, which was cross-border payments uh, and Ripple when it was founded a decade ago, uh, using digital assets, trying to go at that problem. And so we're taking it on head on right now around the world. Uh, our Ripple Nets core product, which is Ripple Payments, uh, has grown dramatically and we can talk about that in this conversation and we also have very exciting new developments as it relates to cbdc's to real world asset tokenization and other developments on the blockchain but one of the important points is we never really deviated from the initial mission of the company which was to use blockchain and crypto to move value faster around the world totally and then maybe building on that kind of idea of you know there are things that have evolved and transformed over the past 10 years and then there are certain things that have stayed the same like using you know immutable ledgers for the transfer of value kind of what are the opportunities you see that have kind of remained there over this decade and will remain there over future decades and kind of what has changed along that time? Yeah, it's an interesting question because we have seen the whole journey here. Maybe it's just the beginning. We hope it is, but certainly we've seen a lot thus far. You know, early on, we took some of our ideas and solutions to big financial institutions um, and if you were lucky to get in the front door, it was a good day. Uh, you certainly almost never saw the boardroom when you brought the topic of blockchain and especially crypto uh, in the early days. So we pivoted. We knew we had a great product and a good concept and went and spoke to some very innovative fintechs and PSPs around the world who understood the value of using blockchain first as a messaging tool to just initially make sure that a sender and receiver could exchange information bilaterally uh, much faster, quicker, more reliably uh, than you could with a one-way transmission that really Swift was offering uh, and still does at the time. And you know, so that went on for some time. We found a lot of success building that network around the world. And as with any network business, we had to be in as many countries as possible to give senders and receivers as many options as possible. Uh, but you know what's interesting is, as the would have it, and really this is really over the last couple of years, the core product solution, which is called on-demand liquidity, has really taken off. And that's using the bridge asset, in this case, XRP, uh, to move that value more and beyond messaging between sender and receiver. And that started with just a couple of countries that would actually allow that product. Uh, three, as a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, we're up to 40 plus now where that is a viable solution um, and is uh, it's been an enormous uptake. So we're excited about that, but we're just scratching the surface. And back to where I started, big banks and financial institutions are much more interested today than they certainly were five or six years ago. We rolled out the product the first time. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, uh, what are some of the emerging crypto or, you know, blockchain based payment trends that you think will significantly impact the, the landscape, you know, in the near future? Is that does it kind of tie back to that, you know, liquidity layer that you were talking about? And what are the opportunities there for, you know, um, individual players to then build off of that foundation? 
I think that, you know, this core problem of how long it takes to move money across borders uh, and whether or not that's a remittance situation where someone's trying to get money from a Saudi oil field and the job they have there back to their family in South Asia or in the Philippines uh, to small and medium enterprise businesses who are uh, doing payroll or paying suppliers. If you're playing at that level, so smaller uh, companies, individual remittances, you're still being charged usurious rates to move money across borders. You still have an inability to really track that payment and make sure that it gets there in a timely fashion and know that with certainty. Um, and you know those haven't gone away. It's it's amazing. I've been building businesses in Asia now for 30 years. That problem is still here and is still a big one. And if anything, as more companies grow and, and more opportunities in the economy you know, you know, kind of grow as it relates to cross-border businesses, uh, we want to be able to provide this solution for them. So if anything, the use case and utility um, has not gone away. And as long as people are being charged 6 or 7% on their money to send a paycheck home, or a small company to send payroll around the various countries they operate in, you've got a huge opportunity to bring that way down and give them a better user experience. Yes, absolutely. You know, we've talked a little bit about transparency, speed, lower cost, kind of drilling into those a little bit more. What are the key advantages um, that using cryptocurrencies as a payment method gives businesses? Um, and then, you know, maybe a two-part question. Uh, what are the challenges that businesses face, particularly in the areas that, you know, you're responsible for, such as APAC and MENA, um, what are those challenges and bottlenecks that crypto can help, you know, remove from the process? Absolutely. I think the, the ability to use a digital asset as the bridge currency in this transaction between sender and receiver, um, it actually brings the whole kind of dream to fruition, if you will, because you actually can have a sender uh, that can lock in an FX rate, uh, have that settlement go across the blockchain, to a receiver on the other end. We've already mentioned countries. It could be the Middle East to South Asia, Middle East, Philippines. We have a variety of corridors around the world that are this in the same uh, same opportunity and have an instantaneous conversion of local currency fiat and then paid out to that local partner into, in the Philippines case, an example, across thousands of islands and villages you know, where the end recipient is waiting for that remittance. And that's true, again, back to small and medium enterprises as well. That same conundrum of how you can actually outside your banks who may or may not offer the service, and if they do, it may be slow, it may be costly, uh, get that supplier paid in a timely way so they'll move that shipment off the dock and get it going in your supply chain. Uh, pay that payroll to your expanding workforce, which is now no longer in just one or two Asian countries, it's gone across Asia. And so these sorts of business growth um, exciting moments come with the need to really move value faster uh, and in more places. And, and back to this core blockchain and crypto solution, we think we're onto something. And certainly, you know, in 70 countries where we operate our Ripple Payments Network, you know, now 40 plus of those have a digital asset and blockchain solution associated with it. And we're very excited about that. Awesome. Yeah. And just you know, maybe building on kind of or, you know, touching on some of those those success areas, you know, are, are there any case studies or um, stories you can share about businesses that have um, effectively utilized crypto for payment purposes? No, I'll give you a, a great example. You know, we've got a great partner here that we've had for a long time, Instarem here in space in Singapore, part of the NIM group, a great player in cross-border payments um, and remittances and, and others. And they have a whole uh, stable of uh, customers around the region and around the world that have a working capital problem with just their own internal treasury. And think about using this same solution for a company to move working capital around to different jurisdictions using this product in the same way you'd move a payments or a payroll moving within internal treasury. That is powerful. Otherwise, you end up as a growing business with working capital stuck in 18 different countries in some minimal amount versus the ability to do that you know, very quickly and efficiently and not have capital locked up. At the end of the day, so much of this is about capital being locked up in pre-funded accounts, in working capital in multiple countries, um, in accounts on the other side of a, a trade. And so that ability to move value around quickly as opposed to locking it all in one place, it just frees up not just capital, but then energy and opportunity for growth in these businesses. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great point and and crucial to the the value proposition of these sure. 
um, you know, modern solutions. Uh, and then just not to veer into the negative too too quickly, but you know, how can concerns around you know volatility, regulatory uncertainties, um, how can these be addressed within the context of business payments? You know, which which kind of need to have that foundational stability um, to scale and to kind of you know ha- have a a broader impact. Yeah, it's so key. It's a great point and great question. You know, we cannot do this unless we go into new markets and new countries have a dialogue with the regulator, first of all, and explain to them what we can bring to this market, what they, we can bring to their business community, what we can bring to their end consumers and therefore citizens, uh, you know, with these sorts of values that you and I have been talking about. But that's really on us to have that, that dialogue. We want to have it. We'd have it in every country if we could. Some places are more receptive than others. But getting that equation right and, and getting that in place um, is an accelerant and is super important. And obviously, one of the reasons we've invested so heavily in places like Singapore and Dubai and elsewhere outside the U.S. is we found jurisdictions that are incredibly excited about what we're doing. They're incredibly excited about having a two-way dialogue with us uh, and being a part of this journey. And you know that's really an important thing to point out. If you don't have that, this gets stuck um, in a way that I think ultimately just constrains growth. Totally. And then just uh, carrying on with that theme of excitement, you know, are there any specific industries or sectors that are, you know, are better suited for adopting cryptocurrency payments or not to make it, you know, a binary, but kind of where they can provide more utility than existing solutions um, currently can? What do you think broadly defined across financial institutions? You know, I think we're just scratching the surface on, you know, medium sized to bigger financial institutions as they in their own technology stack, adopt blockchain solutions, but also in their day-to-day business. And we've seen that, you know, across all of the accounts and, and FIs that we call on. It's just changing. Most people that have the conversations with us several years ago, now most of them have digital asset teams or a digital asset head or people that we can have the dialogue with. And so that is really, really an important change. Um, and so, you know, I think we've got to keep that that whole ecosystem moving forward. And if we can convince regulators, if we can big, 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 convince big financial institutions, but also have other industries figured out to go to their real kind of core of your question. I think about trading businesses a lot. Uh, and I'm thinking about trading of physical goods, people that move goods across multiple borders from you know source of mine or source of wherever the product is coming from, across borders to middlemen customers, uh, ultimately on to end consumers, there's lots of movement that trading companies do cross-border uh, with payments needed at many stops along the way. That we think is a real opportunity in that small and medium enterprise business uh, focus that we have. Uh, clearly, big corporates that are multinationals also have these needs. We do. We haven't by any means you know, given up or not going after that crowd. We think there are some places where for certain corridors, we can go after, you know, big payment corridors that someone may have between um, the end game and the supplier. Um, So we're going to go after that as well. But as far as market opportunities, which is how this conversation started, you know, we're still a company that's growing dramatically. We're global, uh, but we're still only a thousand people. We've got 15 offices around the world. um, And there's a lot of opportunity in the places we've talked about to get it right right now. Totally. And then I think you touched on this a little bit uh, in your answer just now, but you know, where do you see the role of traditional finance playing um, you know, as crypto continues to evolve and become more and more integrated within the you know, payments industry? Or is it a, you know, a regulatory foot in the door, a kind of uh, you know, a, a big partner for some of these you know, more inertia-filled occasions? Um, or just you know, kind of what's the role of this modern and uh, the incumbent versus the emergent, I guess. The fact is at Ripple, we need to go to both crowds. We need to be comfortable and work with traditional finance and big FIs, but also be very uh, in tune with and around our very fast moving innovative FinTech clients. And that bridge to use that word again, but in a different context, the Ripple plays between traditional finance and the digital asset economy and digital asset payments I think is a very important one because you actually need both uh, to create a marketplace and a network and a payments network that is robust um, as the customers, again, whether or not it's a a one remittance uh, situation or a small medium enterprise business or a big corporate, you really end up needing both sides of that equation involved and working together. 
And so we have to bridge it. We have to be cognizant of the needs and issues on both sides and bring people together in the middle over this. Totally. And then, you know, as that, you know, in a perfect world, that interoperability continues to scale and have, you know, a, a greater impact. Um, what are kind of the, you know, first step measures that businesses should know or to take or take um, to, you know, ensure the privacy, security and compliance of their customer transactions when accepting uh, cryptocurrencies? Yeah, super important question and something we're very focused on. You know, we really are an enterprise solution. So in many ways, we're in the middle um, and the plumbing in, in some of these transactions. And so the people that we sign up as partners on our payments network are absolutely, we believe, the best of breed in market. But they're also uh, people that have gone the full length on KYC and AML and everything that you would need to be able to trust a network. Um I came out of another network business, the ride hailing business, and, and you're only as as strong in a network situation as the weakest point in that network. And, you know, something goes wrong or a bad actor gets on that. It's a big problem for everybody involved. And so we take the onboarding process extremely seriously. It's a lengthy process. Um, and what it enables us to do is to have this 70 country network, which you can't build overnight. So it's not a perfect moat. We don't take that for granted and we run as fast as possible and as paranoid as possible, but it's important that we get the right people on the network so that when someone does take that one paycheck or send their payroll, um, they're doing it through a financial institution or a fintech that has been vetted by us, uh, is secure, and the receiver on that same trade has gone through the same rigor. Um, and that is trust, that's network. And if we don't do that, you know, we're at risk of this falling apart. It goes without saying as well, you didn't ask the question, but it's a related question. We certainly can only do business in places um, that are not sanctioned or are appropriate to do business in. And we have a very you know, clear line on the sand on everything about where our network operates. Um, so you know, the, the environment is warming to the, the benefits and the potential of cryptocurrencies, even you know, as you know, we had the, the crypto winter of 2022, but we're almost a year kind of past some of the more human led as opposed to technology led, you know, failures within the sector. Um, as there, you know, as this global paradigm starts to kind of shift, you know, where do you see the future going? Kind of what is the role um, that crypto can play within, you know, these, uh, these areas where there are, you know, noticeable problems and the technology is there, kind of what needs to shift to make that technology you know, have the impact that, that it can? Well, let me give you two other areas we haven't talked about that we see real opportunity and we're building businesses around at Ripple, which are natural in some ways extensions of, of what we learned and have built on the payment side, um, but also in their own way, kind of new and in some cases, you know, very uh, hot opportunities and stuff that is being talked about a lot with, with you all and in the press. Uh, central bank digital currencies on one hand, and real world asset tokenization on the other. And I'll just hit them both in that order very quickly. But on CBDCs, we actually had a, a dedicated effort very early on that started a couple of years ago. Um, and we have gone out you know, to central banks around the world. And we believe, you know, based on, on good research that you know, some 90% of central banks around the world are looking at opportunities on the CBDC front. Now, some of them are well down the road, you know, the Chinese central bank, of course, the digital yuan. But others are, you know, early stages in their discussion, learning. About it. And it goes back to that role that we like to play at Ripple, which is how can we come in and bring our best technology solution, go into dialogue with you about what we can solve with a product. And so we've had real uptake. And, you know, I'll give you a few examples. We have uh, our first MOU that we signed was with the Kingdom of Bhutan, um, which is a very forward leaning uh, country on the digital asset and payment front. Uh, Palau, uh, very interesting CBDC there. Uh, we're involved in a very exciting project with the HKMA in Hong Kong. Uh, we're part of the e Hong Kong dollar sandbox, and, and we're going after a potential tokenization opportunity around real estate equity. Uh, that'll be announced, and you know the results of that in the next month or so. Uh, we're involved in Montenegro with the central bank there, in Colombia, and in dialogue with many more. Now, the solution and, and platform that we provide, you know, may be needed in different ways depending on where central banks are on that journey. Uh, but the dialogue is strong. The team is global, and we think it's a great opportunity. And it's also a place where the, again, the real world benefit of of blockchain and digital assets can can find a home. Switching gears to real world assets and the tokenization, that's also extremely exciting right now, and it's something that we've 
you know, we watched emerge, but I think about it, I came out of the financial services world originally and kind of classic uh, on the trading side, investment banking side in the early days, the equity markets and fixed income markets. And you think about some of the opportunities in those markets now around the world to tokenize financial assets, uh, corporate bonds, the settlement of which is, is extremely onerous and, and takes forever. Uh, the notion of tokenizing financial products uh, in those markets is very exciting. The private equity business, also really interesting. And you've seen uh, great firms like KKR or Hamilton Lane or others do this with new funds where they actually tokenize a share of the actual fund itself, opening up to new classes of investors. Also very interesting and efficient on the secondary sale of private equity side. And so I think we're just getting started there. And that goes without even touching real estate, where we're deeply involved in Hong Kong, as we mentioned. Uh, but the tokenization of real estate or equity on real estate is really exciting. So again, these are these are new use cases, but they're real and they're big. And what our job is, is to get in front of customers that we think could use our technology solutions. Um, and I, candidly, this is such a big market for all of us that we also care very deeply about the entire ecosystem. We want to kind of raise everybody up with us that's working on this from from you all to to competitors to everybody that we have is, you know, is important in making this big. We're early, early innings to use a cricket. I lived in India or baseball analogy in all this game. Awesome. Well, yeah, I think that's a great note to end on. Um, thank you so much for your time today, Brooks. Really enjoyed the chance to speak. Uh, and just thank you again. You bet. Thank you for having me and for uh, we appreciate the opportunity. Well, there you have it directly from Brooks and Whistle from Ripple here. Trade finance payments bridging the old world to the new world. Network trust. Yeah. Bhutan, Palau, Hong Kong, Monetary Authority, tokenized assets and real estate, tokenizing bonds. Montenegro, Colombia, you know the drill. This to me is extremely exciting to know that RippleNet in over 70 plus countries, XRP already being used in 40 plus countries. Very exciting information, everybody. I'm going to rest my voice. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe. Leave a comment below. Not financial advice from me or anyone else. I'll catch all of you on the next one.